How to drive individual pins on a RISC-V development kit. This is a follow-up on my earlier video on getting started with two development kits for the RISC-V microcontroller. The first one being the SparkFun Thing Plus board, and the second being the Arduino-like SparkFun Red 5 Red board. Both boards use a Freedom E310 microcontroller from Sci-5 Incorporated, and they're both based on the Hi-5-1 Rev B board. The coding in the other videos was done in Freedom Studio for Windows and Linux. I will use Freedom Studio again today, so if you don't already have it installed, be sure to check out the earlier video. In that video, we confirmed the system was working by printing text messages through the USB cable. To do more with electronics, robotics, and communication systems, we need to control the individual pins. Essentially, we're trying to do a digital write. It's a little counterintuitive because the numbering system on the board and its markings is not necessarily the same numbering system that we need to use in the software. So today, we have four objectives. Controlling the pins using the Metal GPIO library, generating our own time delays, producing code to generate a red, green, and blue LED sequence, and of course, uploading everything to the controller. Today, I'll be using the smaller development kit, which is the Dev15799. However, the larger 15594 is so similar that all you need to do is change a couple of pin numbers. And besides that, you only need one red LED, one green LED, and two 1K resistors to limit their current. I also recommend having a solderless breadboard. When you select the LEDs, you should make sure to use the smaller indicator types that are meant to operate at about 20 milliamps or less. You should avoid the more powerful illumination types, like the kind you would find in flashlights, motor vehicles, and accent lighting. Those are simply going to draw too much electric current. And from what I can tell from the documentation, 20 milliamps is probably close to the upper limit that this chip can supply without taking damage. And as always, this is best done in an anti-static location. Finally, you should keep in mind that the I.O. pins of the RISC-V microcontroller operate on 3.3 volt logic. If for some reason you need to interface it to 5 volt logic, or a higher voltage, you need to use some form of level shifting in between them. Luckily, we won't need that today. In general, it's a good idea to either erase or program a microcontroller before you attach it to a new circuit for the first time. So I'm going to attach the development board to the computer first, reprogram it, and then attach the resistors and LEDs after I confirm it has the upcoming program. So for now, let's just start by opening the Freedom Studio IDE. Go ahead and select your workspace directory, the default is usually good enough, and then immediately create a blank project by selecting File, New, Create a Freedom E SDK product. In the resulting window, select the target as Sci-5 Hi-5-1 Rev B. Below that, select Example Program Empty. This will give your project the default name of Sci-5 Hi-5-1 Rev B Empty, or something similar. But in the project name field, you can pretty much rename it to anything that doesn't contain any spaces. Renaming is optional, so pick whichever name you prefer and then click finish. After a short processing delay, you should see the edit configurations window. There's really nothing to change at this point, so simply click close. With that, you should return to the basic IDE with a view of the near empty main.c program. The only thing it contains are a few comments and a nearly empty main function. So let's first remove the comment and then start programming by including three files. The first file is standardio.h. The second file is time.h. This contains a clock function that we'll need later. And apparently if we don't include it, you may get a compiler warning. Last but not least, we include the gpio.h file where gpio stands for general purpose input output. The metal library shows that this is a bare metal implementation, meaning that we don't necessarily need a underlying operating system on the RISC-V system in order to use it. Later in our code, we need to add a one second startup delay and one second dwell time between LED state changes. So let's go ahead and define both of those times in microseconds somewhere above the main function. In our next step, we need to create our own delay function to make the program idle for a fixed amount of time. SparkFun and their GitHub page have provided a way to generate approximate time delays using the clock function. It's similar to the millisecond function 
in the Arduino IDE because it constantly counts upward without our own intervention. The main difference is that the clock function increments at a much higher speed. In this project, I've renamed the function delay underscore us as a reminder to only pass microseconds as the input argument. Next, we need to select the exact GPIO pins that are best for the project. Since we're only driving LEDs, it doesn't really matter too much. So I've randomly selected IO0 to drive the red LED and IO1 for green. The anode of the onboard blue LED for both boards is physically wired to the SCK serial clock pin. This isn't as simple as it might look because the silkscreen layers on the board don't necessarily match the numbering system used by the software development kit or even the device datasheet. On this board, pin 0 on the silkscreen actually is IO number 0 for the physical chip. However, on the larger dev 15594, the connector is physically marked as pin 8 and no pin is marked 0. To help sort this out, I wrote my own pin definitions based on schematics that I could find on the SparkFun website, and even though these definitions are experimental and untested, you can feel free to reference them or copy-paste them by visiting the link in the description. Each line will specify exactly how the pin is marked on the silkscreen layer, followed by the true I.O. number, followed by other notes and features that you might find useful. Speaking of which, if you find this sort of thing useful, be sure to like and share the video. This helps me figure out exactly what people are interested in, and it helps the channel in general. Because I'm using the smaller dev 15799 board, I'm using these three pins to control red, green, and blue. So now that we have the pin numbering sorted out, we need to go back into our main function and add that one second startup delay. In reality, this is totally optional, but as a force of habit, I do like to give the electrical system at least a few milliseconds in order to stabilize. Below that line, I'm going to add a print statement that will let our terminal know if the system resets unexpectedly. Again, it's a force of habit, so you can consider it optional. Next, we need to create a structure for a metal GPIO interface. We'll do it using the metal GPIO get device command, and we'll simply pass a zero as the only argument. Note that even though we're using several pins, we only need to do this once for this project. Next, it's time to place those three pins in output mode. So we'll do this using metal GPIO enable output. The first argument is going to be the GPIO device that we just created, and the second argument is going to be the I.O. number. There's also an equivalent for this if you want input pins instead, but output is all I'm using today. The onboard blue LED is a little counterintuitive. Because it's shared with the serial clock function, we need to disable that function first. We can do this using the metal GPIO disable pin mux command, where pin mux is just short for pin multiplexer. If we don't include this line, the blue LED will function during debug mode when it's attached to the computer. However, once you detach it, it won't work as intended unless you reconnect it to the debugger. Now it's time to alter the pin states. To do this, I'm going to create a while loop and at the end of every loop, I want to report cycle complete. Above that, we'll activate the red LED by writing a 1 to the output using the metal GPIO set pin function, and then delay for the dwell time. Next, we set the red LED low by writing a 0. followed by writing a 1 to the green LED. We add another delay. Then deactivate the green. Activate the blue. Delay one more time. And then deactivate blue before starting over from the top. And that completes the program. To get an entire version of this that you can copy and paste, you can visit the Unboxing Tomorrow website in the description, double check everything, and if you do make changes, save after the change, and then compile or build the program by either clicking the hammer icon or by right-clicking your project name in the Project Explorer, and then clicking Build. Look to the Console and Problem sections to see if you have any errors or unexpected warnings and hopefully you should be good to upload the code to the system. 
plug in the development board if you haven't already, and create a new run configuration for this project by right-clicking the project name in the Project Explorer, and then navigating to Run Run Configurations. In the resulting window on the left side, you probably want to look in the Sci-5 GDB Segger JLink Debugging section, and somewhere within it, you should see this empty project. Select the project, and simply click Run. After a short delay, the GNU Debugger, or GDB, will start up and your program will be uploaded to the RISC-V chip. From this point forward, you can re-upload if you ever need to, by simply clicking the Run button, or the drop-down symbol next to it. And if everything uploaded correctly, you should see the blue LED blinking. After you eject and unplug the development kit, go ahead and attach the resistors and the LEDs, and then reapply power. With any luck, you should now see the red, green, and blue LEDs flashing. However, if we look at the timing, I can see that the dwell time is much closer to half a second than a full second. As a reminder, the delay function is just an approximation, and this is something I'd like to cover a little bit more in detail in the future. For now, the simple fix is to simply double the delays from 1 million to 2 million, and it's worth noting that the clock function is only as accurate as the system clock. If you're looking for a high degree of accuracy across several days, for example, then you probably want to use a real-time clock or a real-time clock calendar. Finally, a closing note on the LED current. If you want to drive high current devices like motors, illuminators, heaters, and so on, then you're going to need a external driver such as a low side driver, a high side driver, an H bridge, or even a motor driver. These are all topics that I plan to cover very soon, so stay posted to see them used with the Risk v In the meantime, you can also support the Unboxing Tomorrow Patreon page. There, we have a monthly poll and lessons learned on technical builds like this one. The poll for November 2020 basically wants to know, do you expect any type of travel boom in the year 2021? Stay posted for the next project in electronics, robotics, IoT, and communication systems. And as always, have a great day.